Hey, good morning. good morning. Welcome to Mount Calvary. We're doing things a little differently today. Our order of service is a, a little bit different. We are pleased to have the Emmanuel Quartet with us today. They are going to uh, share in worship with us here in just a few moments. Uh, we thought that we would um, take the opportunity to get into God's Word and sort of a, let this moment in God's Word be the foundation for us and how we worship when they come to sing. And so um, I want to ask you to have your Bibles open to chapter 5 of Romans today. Uh, I'd also like to ask you to be praying for me. Yes, I have a cold slash allergy slash I don't know what. It's, um, um, it started off as what I was pretty certain as allergies. Uh, the, the rain and the cold and everything else that's come in here has sort of settled it deep into my chest now. You know, they call it hay fever for a reason. I haven't run a temperature, but it feels like a fever sometimes. I'm feeling better today. I think I'm on the mend. But uh, y'all pray for me. Pray for my voice. Uh, it may be a shorter message than I intended. I don't know. We'll see how that goes. Don't pray that it's a shorter message than I intended. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's pray together right now and, uh, and ask the Lord to bless us. Father, you are so good. You are good uh, and glorious and grand, and you are in charge of the moments of our lives. You're in charge of this moment right here. Help us to submit ourselves under your care and under your word. Holy Spirit, teach us and guide us and lead us. Uh, and help us to not be ashamed of the gospel. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning to you. We've been working our way through this letter to, to Rome that the Apostle Paul wrote back uh, since May, actually. And so, obviously, we're in chapter 5, and that means we're not going too fast, okay? We're not moving too fast through this letter. This letter is way too important to rush through. I mean, I mean, can you imagine being a Christian in Rome? At the Roman church, and you get a letter from the preeminent Christian missionary in the world, the Apostle Paul. I mean, this guy saw Jesus on the road uh, to Damascus. He, he was one of the apostles, and he writes this letter to your congregation. I mean, you'd be hanging on every word, would you not? I mean, for instance, suppose, now, you know, we, we lost one of the great men of history when Billy Graham passed away recently, but suppose we received a letter from him that he wrote shortly before his death, and he said, he said listen, I, I know your church, I know the people in your church, and I want to send this gift to you as an encouragement. I'd love to come visit you one day. We don't know whether that's going to happen or not, but I'm going to I, I want to just encourage you. We would, we'd hang on every word that he said, would we not? I mean, dear Mount Calvary, I know what you're going through. I know your struggles. I know your trials. Uh, this is my gift to you. So, so Paul writes a letter to the church in Rome. It's a good church. It's, it's not without problems. Uh, it's a church that, that had a witness that was reaching the ends of the earth. I mean, that's the kind of church that this was. So the people around the world knew about the faith of the Roman Christians. So Paul writes the letter. They all sit down together in the church, and the elders stand up to read this letter, and it starts so encouraging. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then also to the Gentile, because it's in the gospel that the righteousness of faith is revealed from faith for faith. In other words, by faith, we understand God's righteousness and how it can be in our lives, but also that faith that gives us our salvation grows us in our faith and leads us to obedience. The good news tells us that our faith saves us and it produces even more faith. I mean, this is awesome. The people are hearing this letter. They are so excited. We got a letter from the Apostle Paul. Woo but then the elders keep reading. And Paul begins to explain what he means by the gospel by diving into some very heavy doctrine. Let me say the word again, doctrine. I mean, what comes to your mind when you hear that word from the preacher? Boring. <laughs> I mean, some people today, they, they tend to describe doctrine as being irrelevant or the stuff that seminary students and professors get excited about, but the common man doesn't really care. I mean, preacher, we don't want doctrine. We just need practical, relevant teaching. I mean, we don't want to. We don't. We don't want to deal with heavy stuff. We want to be able to face the daily struggles of our life and know what the Bible has to say about that. So give us the how-tos of Christianity. And, and we want you to use the Bible. Get this. We want you to use the Bible, but but skip over the heavy stuff so we can get to the good stuff. Now, I don't think anybody in this church would say it exactly likes that. I, I know that. But, ladies and gentlemen, that is the prevailing attitude among Christianity today. 
Um, I was flipping through the TV channels last Sunday night, and we have so many channels, it's impossible to watch all the different channels we have. It's, it's too many. And, but so so I, sometimes I find myself sort of mindlessly going from one to the next to the next to the next. And, and I came across a channel where there was a famous Christian speaker, very well-known Christian speaker, standing up in front of a large audience. And so I decided I would listen for a while. And, and she was talking about making decisions. And frankly, she was giving some really good advice. It was, it was actually very good. And every once in a while, she even threw in a Bible verse or two. <laughs> and after a while, it sort of hit me. There's nothing that she has said here that I couldn't get from a football coach in the locker room. Now, it was good, good stuff. But ladies and gentlemen, can I just tell you that God didn't give us the Bible as a pep talk to help us get through our day. He gave us the Word of God so we can understand Him, so we can learn about Him. And if you're ever going to approach the inapproachable God, you better have something deeper in your soul than just the philosophy of men. You see, the good, the good news is not a self-help program. And you didn't become a Christian through practical how-to philosophy. You came to faith in Jesus through deep, deep doctrinal truth. Okay? And so the Apostle Paul, he'd be baffled by this idea that, that exists in our church today, that preacher, we don't need doctrine, just give us stuff that's, that's relevant, practical. I mean, in every one of the letters that he wrote, he always started off his letters with deep doctrine. In fact, that usually dominates the, the biggest part of the letter. And then he will, from that doctrine, tease out all the practical, relevant applications that the scriptures have based on what he's already taught. And so the practical advice that we see in the scripture is always anchored in the doctrinal truth that gets laid out in those really heavy, deep sections in his letters. So let's be really clear then about what God intends for us to do in his word. He, he, he wants us to know him and he wants us to enjoy him forever. He wants our knowledge of him to be growing deeper and deeper. And we do that through what we call doctrine. And so as we begin to know him better, then the practical realities start to under, we get to understand our purpose in life and we get to understand how our brokenness has changed life, but our salvation and our glorious future and all the practical everyday help that comes out of God's word come to us through the riches of his glorious being. And Romans is no exception. In fact, the first 11 chapters of Romans are pretty much going to be all very heavy doctrine, really deep theology. And, and, and then the last five chapters of Romans, he's going to draw some practical conclusions that come out of all of this. Sometimes it comes directly out of the text, and other times it's things that he does that he addresses very specific things that the Roman church was dealing with. Now, for those of you who feel maybe just a little bit overwhelmed with all this heavy doctrine, I mean, you've been, some of you summer folks, you've been here all summer long, and I've tried every Sunday as we get into some of these really difficult and hard passage, passages, I've tried to always bring you know, relevant, practical, helpful truth every single Sunday. But the Apostle Paul does the same thing for us. He recognizes that in the midst of all this stuff that there are, there are reasons to give even little glimpses throughout his letter of the practical advice that he'll give later on. And so every once in a while, it's like Paul just inserts something that, that previews this wonderful and eminently helpful blessing of our faith. And Romans chapter 5 begins with just such a section. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse number 1. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith... Now, by the way, that's, that's really deep doctrine right there, okay? Because we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, in, in just these two verses here, the mingling of doctrine and practical blessings could not be more apparent. I mean, much of the first three chapters of Romans are dedicated to this very intense uh, conversation, doctrine, theology of the sinfulness of man and basically says we've been at war with God. I mean, later on in this very chapter, Paul's going to use that terminology again, that warfare term terminology in chapter 5, verse 10, when he says that we were once enemies of God. But now, what does he say? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's at once both very doctrinal and very practical, it's a blessing that comes to us because of our faith. What it does is it establishes our position before God because we are no longer in contention with God. We are at peace with God. That's huge. He no longer opposes us. He's brought us into his family. And get this, we are his people. We have a standing before God. We stand in grace. That means we can rest before God. 
And we have confidence in him. All because Jesus became the substitute for the forgiveness of our sins. All because we've been justified by faith. Do you remember the big doctrinal term that we use for what Jesus did for us? We call it substitutionary atonement. He was our substitute that covered our sins. I owed a debt I couldn't pay and Jesus paid it all. He bore my burdens to Calvary and he suffered and he died alone. Ooh, those words sound familiar, do they not? They come from some of our hymns, which, by the way, are filled with doctrine. You've been learning doctrine sometimes and didn't realize it. Isn't that amazing? Then we look here in verse number two. Through faith, we are not only at peace with God, but we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Some of the greatest words in, in the Bible. I want you to zero in on those words there, to rejoice in hope, because finally, for the first time in this letter, I mean, it's taken him all the way up to chapter 5, Paul has actually given us something that we're supposed to be doing. He hasn't given us a single commandment all the way up until this moment right here, and now he says, I want you to rejoice in hope. Now that I've explained this glorious, deep, theological truth about who God is and what your condition is and what Jesus has done for us, Therefore, now, rejoice in hope. It's one of the key concepts of our Christian faith, to have joy. In the scriptures, what we learn is, is that, that joy is supposed to be a perpetual experience of the Christian walk. Now, now, we're not told that life is always happy. We're just not told that. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made a big deal about the fact that, that we should be rejoicing and be glad when others revile you and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. Those are not happy occasions. Jesus didn't say, turn your frown upside down. That's not what he said there. He said, you have an eternal destiny, and your reward is only growing when you are in the midst of very sad seasons of life. In the good times and the bad times, it is the Christian ethic to be people of joy. Why? Because we have hope in the glory of God. So even rooted here in this very practical advice that has been given to us, this theological doctrinal evidence of who God is, is the foundation for everything. His immense glory is where we find our joy. You see, I think this is the essential thing that a lot of Christians miss when we contemplate the rejoicing that we are supposed to be having, that the scriptures teach us that we're supposed to have, this rejoicing that we have, when we contemplate that, we miss the glory of God, and therefore our joy is not exactly right. Because here's the thing. We have become so addicted to our own glory that the command to rejoice always, many times among Christians, becomes a self-serving ego trip. Oh, look at me. I can smile in the middle of my trials. Look at me. I have peace in the middle of this storm. Look at me. I know things are going to be all right for me. Well, guess what? Things aren't always going to be all right. I mean, Christians don't always win. Christians don't always conquer cancer. Christians don't always survive. Christians get martyred. Christians get persecuted. And Christians sometimes lose. Some of you are celebrating right now because of things that are happening in politics and maybe because in the Supreme Court a, a justice got elected in that you're happy got elected in. Uh, maybe you think that because your candidate made it in, this country's headed in the right direction. Can I just tell you, this country is not headed in the right direction. Not unless Jesus is king, this country is not headed in the right direction. You can have a president in the office who's a Christian, but this country is still going to be headed in the wrong direction because men mess it up. And, and, and you just need to get this. When Jesus comes in to claim his kingdom, he's not riding on the back of a donkey or an elephant. You'll get that sooner or later. <laughs> So no matter how much you celebrated last week or if you happen to be of a different political persuasion, how much you cried last week, if your rejoicing is based on your circumstances or your expectations rather than hope in the glory of God, you are walking in the shallow end of the pool. And that's why you need a deeper, 
doctrinal commitment because you need to quit chasing after shallow, man-centered theology. I mean, if you think about it, what I've just said explains so much of what's wrong with modern-day Christianity, in my opinion. The, the word theology means the study of God. But in too many churches, too many messages from celebrated Bible teachers, we really do a much better job of studying man than we do studying God. We're a whole lot better at anthropology than we are at theology. So, we need to review the doctrine that we've seen so far in Romans. Uh, and I want to just give you one simple, very practical application this morning that comes out of what we've been seeing here in Romans to this point. That's what Paul does here, and he just gives us a little glimpse of it. The glory of it is going to be further expounded later on in this, chat, in this book, this letter. But here, let's just sort of set ourselves in the context of where we are now when we come to chapter 5. Those first three chapters were so heavy, heavy in this whole doctrinal idea that man is broken by sin. We are sinners, all of us, beyond repair. Paul went so far as to say that there's none of us who's righteous, not even one. For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay, do you hear that phrase there? The glory of we've fallen short of God's glory. So it doesn't matter if you grew up in a religious tradition or a non-religious tradition, if you grew up in church or didn't grow up in church, the law still applies to you. The law still judges you because we are hopeless to live the law. And even people who haven't grown up in religion have enough evidence of God around them that they are forced to suppress what truth they know in order to deny the existence of God. The creation itself speaks out, and we, supp we suppress that truth, and therefore we all stand condemned before God. But salvation is available to us through faith, not in our own works, but in the work of Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And Paul says we must therefore find salvation in the obedience of faith. Is the term that he uses there. Not that we must obey to be saved, but that faith produces in us an obedience. Abraham becomes therefore in chapter 4 this great example of what faith looks like. He believed in God and it was counted to him as righteousness. But then Abraham also acted on what God told him to do. And so Abraham was both saved by his faith apart from works, no work of the law at all. And at the same time, did the works of the law even before the law was established because God told him to. So you live in faith if you are a person of faith. And living in faith means you live in obedience. So that's where we've come to. And so now here in Romans chapter 5, Paul starts his letter off, this, uh, this chapter off with the word therefore. And you could say, well, maybe that goes back into chapter 4 and talks about Abraham and therefore what all we've seen in Abraham. I think it probably refers back all the way to chapter 3 in verse number 21 when we read that the righteousness of God has been made known apart from the law and this righteousness was given to us through faith for all who believe in Jesus Christ. And so it's like chapter 4 is almost like this big parenthesis. It's like chapter 3 it's terrible, we're lost, we're broken, we're desperately in sin, there's no hope except God's righteousness can be given to us through faith. And then he shows us how it works in Abraham, big parentheses, and now, therefore, because of this righteousness of faith that we can have, he says, since we've been justified by faith, what happens? We have peace with God. Now, you know, it, I, I can't avoid this. When I'm teaching through a book in the Bible, I can't, I can't avoid this happening to me. It's like Romans is on my mind all the time. I go to a Bible study on, on, on Monday mornings and we're studying Genesis. But every time he says something in Genesis, I'm thinking about how Romans applies. And I'll, I'll, people will be asking me, you know, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I'll be like, well, Romans really sort of speaks into this. Debbie says, do you want your state medium rare or, or well done? And I'm like, you know, what does Romans have to say about that? I don't know. Let me think. Um, it's like every part of my life, you know, it's like I'm just thinking about it. Well, I was thinking about these, these first four chapters and what they teach, and, and it just instantly drew my mind to the passage in the New Testament, which is my, I call this my life passage. You know, if, if I had a life verse, it'd be Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse number 1, all the way down through verse number 10. And so, and, and I, I, I preach from those verses even here in this at this place before, and I, I meditate on those verses a lot. I think about them all the time, uh, and I could quote them to you from the translation that I memorized them in, but what I want to do is I want to give you Ephesians chapter 2, and I'd like to paraphrase for you what Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 11 sound like. It goes like this. It says, it wasn't long ago that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin, and you let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. And you filled your lungs with polluted unbelief. 
and then you exhale disobedience. We all did it. All of us doing what we felt like doing. When we felt like doing it, all of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with the whole lot of us. Instead, immense in his mercy and with an incredible love, he embraced us. And he took our sin-dead lives and he made us alive with Christ. And he did all this on his own. We had no part in it at all. Then he picked us up and he set us down in the highest heavens in company with Jesus, our Messiah. And now God has us where he wants us. With all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea. He did all the work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. God's gift to us is from start to finish. We didn't play a major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging about it and about all the things that we'd done. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does and, and the good works that he has gotten ready for us to do. Work that we'd better be doing and so we shouldn't take this for granted. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, first part of 11. That's pretty good, isn't it? So do you see why I can stand up here and tell you that joy is a perpetual mark of the Christian experience? Not that it's a, not a periodic mark, not like, a, well, we have joy and sorrow, joy. That's not what, it, joy is something that marks the Christian, even though we know that life has its ups and downs. Joy is constant and perpetual because God's glory is constant and perpetual. In fact, Romans 5 goes on to talk about how life does give us trials in the next few verses. It talks about these trials produce patience and endurance and endurance character and character hope. And we're going to talk about that more in the future. But, but we all realize life has its rhythms up and down. But perpetual joy in the Christian life is never based on the rhythms of our life. It's based on God's glory, period. And so we're meant to find joy in God and his glory, no matter what the circumstances. And that's not some kind of Christian doublespeak. Oh, I'm, ha I'm not happy, but I have joy. <laughs> I mean, those kind of statements feel, make us feel really inauthentic, don't they? I mean, even worse, sometimes we do more harm than good. You ever, you ever known somebody to try to go into the life of someone who's in brokenness and they try to cheer them up? Sometimes that that's actually hurts instead of helps. I actually bought a book here just recently called uh, When Helping Hurts. And, and one of the chapters in there talks about the fact that sometimes... Our intentions to help people is actually doing more harm than good. Yeah. Listen to what Proverbs chapter 25 verse 20 says. Whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day or like vinegar mixed with soda. You ever seen what happens when vinegar and soda get mixed? I mean, there's, you should Google it sometime. Get on and, and look at what happens. You put vinegar and soda in a bottle and then you screw the lid on tight uh, and you shake it up a little bit. That thing's going to explode. There, there are videos of people almost losing their hands. I mean, how much damage do we do in people's lives when we try to force happiness into the lives of someone who's going through a time of sorrow? That is not what the text is saying here. This is, this is way different than just put a smile on your face. This is something that's rooted in a deep doctrinal understanding of the glory of God. Now, I'm just going to tell you, we, we, can't, we can't possibly really fully explore the depths of God's glory. Because he is inapproachable God. He is, he is light beyond light. He is, he is holiness beyond holiness. All the ways that we use to describe him are, are that he's indescribable. The words we use fall way short of really describing this glorious God. The Apostle Paul opens up the glory of God in all of his writings. And it would be impossible for us to really fully explore all those dimensions. But what I want to do is, I just want to share with you just three very practical ways that God is glorious that we have already learned about from Romans. And, they, and it's just rooted in, in the Old Testament theology, rooted in things that we already know about. If you grew up in church, these Sunday school lessons and the Psalms and places where you've already read about God's glory, Paul takes these things that he knows about who God is, and he brings them to us in this form of this really deep theology. For instance, in Psalm chapter 19, uh, David wrote, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. 
They have no speech, nor they, and they use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their, their words to the end of the world. Well, how did Paul process that glorious creator God? Well, Romans chapter 1, verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Listen, take a moment today when you step outside to revel in the glorious creation of God and know that God spoke the world into existence. He spoke the beauty of this place into, into existence. And speaking of creation, think about what was said in Psalm chapter 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens, and through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Who are we when you look at this creation and when you look at how small we are in the universe? Who are we that God would care about us? Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him, for he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and he built it on the ocean's depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands are pure, only those who do not worship idols and never tell lies. And David understood that to be the rescue of God because he couldn't do that. And so he concludes in Psalm 24 by saying, Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, invincible in battle. Open up, O ancient gates. Open up, ancient doors. And let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the King of glory. Man, what amazing imagery we have right there. And by the way, he is the king of heaven's armies. We actually sing one of those songs here that we sing. The king of heaven's armies is always by my side. Can you picture this? That you have peace with the king of heaven's armies. He is by your side and, and going against the enemies. You are not his opponent anymore. You know, listen, when you picture that, picture this glorious, majestic, righteous warrior God. You need to see that image and you need to hang on to that image. And I think sometimes we are done such a terrible disservice by some of the images that have filtered into our minds over the years about who God is and, and, and who angels are. I mean, he's the king of angel armies. Angels are not little bitty babies with diapers floating around on the clouds. I mean, I, I'll never forget, there was a TV show on recently, uh, not too long ago, it was a series, it was called The Bible, and they portrayed angels. It's the only time I've ever really seen anybody, I think, get angels close to being right. They had these angels, and I mean, there was this magnificent warrior dressed in full battle armor with his sword, and there was this halo of light engulfing him that almost were shaped like wings behind him. And it was like, if you look wrong at that guy, he will snap your head off. I mean, that was the angel. And I was like, oh, they finally got it right. That's what an angel looks like. Imagine an army of angels who are at the bidding of the Lord and they're by your side. You have peace with God. Isn't that amazing? Well, how does Paul process this whole thing from Romans? Chapter 1, we learn that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the mortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Listen, when you see this warrior, righteous God, the king of heaven's armies, we are foolish to oppose him. And yet Paul wrote that that was all of us. We all were his enemies in opposition to him. And now we have found peace. Our glorious God is a righteous warrior God. He is right to judge the nations. He is right to judge those who stand in opposition to him. And you may not see that judgment here, but judgment will come. And we don't revel in judgment except to know that his judgments are always righteous. So let us pray that God is more than glorious in his judgments. 
Does the Bible also teach, perhaps, that God is glorious in His mercy? Because we're going to need that, right? If He's a warrior, righteous God, we're going to need His mercy too, right? Well, let me just go back to the Old Testament and remind you of a story that took place in the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 32, Moses is up on Sinai, and the nation of Israel once again rebelled against God. They fashioned this golden calf, and they began to worship this God of human design, exactly what we just were talking about here in Romans chapter 1. I mean, after all they'd seen, they still believed that they needed a God of human making. I mean, they'd seen, they'd seen the ten plagues that rescued them out of Egypt. They'd seen, they'd walked through water in the Red Sea. I, I don't know, I have long told myself that if I was one of those people walking through the Red Sea, I would never doubt God. But guess what? They doubted God. In fact, Moses alone on the mountain and Joshua and Caleb up there with him were the only ones who weren't participating in this pagan idolatry. And God told Moses, you know what? I'm going to start over with you just like I did with Abraham. I'm not going with those people. And that terrified Moses. He said, God, if you won't go with us, don't send us anywhere. And God replied, I will give mercy. Verse 17, chapter 33, I'll do the very thing you've asked. Now, in the midst of that, Moses then got really bold and he asked God, he says, show me your glory. And listen to this beautiful, glorious word from God. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 19, God said to Moses, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And you may recall this moment because God told him that you could not survive seeing my glory without a filter. He said, so he put Moses in the cleft of the rock and covered him with his hand. Oh, that's doctrine too. And it shows up in another hymn you might be familiar with. The great Fanny Crosby wrote, A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. see Fanny Crosby got it, right? By the way, she was blind. She could see a whole lot better than a lot of other people, that's for sure. And so that's why Paul, in Romans 3.23, wrote that we're all sinners. We've fallen short of God's glory. We, we can't achieve this. Not, we can't achieve what Moses even just got a little glimpse of, and it almost killed him. We can't, even achieve, we can't achieve that. And yet, while we are still sinners, Romans 5, 6-11, while we were still powerless, Christ died for us. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from condemnation. Since our friendship with God is restored by the death of His Son, while we were His enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of His Son. So now we can rejoice. There it is again. We can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Hallelujah. You're no longer at war with God. You have peace with God. And you don't just have access to God. You stand in His presence in grace. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we're only starting to get a little bit of a glimpse of the consideration of our glorious God. But do you not even now have enough information about God's glory to rejoice and be exceedingly glad in the hope of God's glory? Already. As hard as Romans might have been on all of us getting to this point, if, if all we knew about God was his creative glory, and if all we knew about him was his righteous warrior glory in the judgment of sin, or if all we knew about him was this glorious mercy in giving consideration to us by rescuing us from, from, uh, from judgment in Christ Jesus, do we not have enough reason to always live with joy in our hearts? Always. In the hope of God's glory, not the hope of our glory. You see, that very first of Paul's practical applications for the glory of God um, it, uh, and us to have joy in life is rooted in deep doctrine. This is deep stuff. This is not shallow. And we have yet to really dive into the deep stuff. We're still on the surface in a lot of ways because our journey through Romans is not complete. We have a lot more to see about God's glory and the hope that comes from that. And, and so... Paul goes to great lengths to dive in deeper in this amazing letter because it's not the shallow of orthodoxy, shallow orthodoxy of men that's going to preserve us in the midst of the kind of struggles that, that Rome was going through and that we inevitably will go through. It's the depths of God's glory that preserves us. So ladies and gentlemen, don't ever be afraid to go deep in the exploration of God. I, I wrote this as sort of a summary statement and I want to close with an illustration, but I just wrote this as a challenge to all of us. 
people who will not dive deep into the riches of God's glory through the discipline of systematic and devotional study of God's word are destined to live in the shallow end of their faith. So get in the word, stay in the word, be systematic in the word, and don't skip over the stuff that's hard. Let that hard stuff, the deep stuff, strengthen you and grow you. Uh, years ago, Christian author Max Lucado wrote a book called Six Hours, One Friday. Um, the, the Six Hours, One Friday was in reference to the, the time that Christ was hanging on the cross. But he gave an illustration uh, that helped uh, throughout the book for, that he returned to quite often. As he talked about in 1979 when Hurricane David was bearing down on Miami, Florida, and that, that city suffered six hours of an onslaught of of the hurricane it said that in those days he was single and he and some other single guys had purchased a houseboat it was a leaky old little houseboat that wasn't worth an awful lot but they wanted to save it from the storm so in their preparations for the hurricane that was coming he wrote that we went out and bought enough rope that we could have tied down the queen mary and so it was like so they, they got the rope to this boat and they tied it to the moorings at the dock and then they ran some even longer ropes out to some trees on the land and tied it to trees and they said they even tied the boat to the itself and he said it was like a, a bad episode of a kale's navy a bunch of landlubbers doing stuff that they thought would be the right thing that they needed to do to preserve this boat and when he says when they were done they looked at it and it looked like this big old giant boat had gotten caught up in a spider web he said it was a wonder that none of them had gotten tied up to the boat well fortunately a seasoned veteran of the seas saw what they were doing and he went up to these unexperienced young men and he gave them some very important advice he said boys if you tie her to the land you're going to regret it those trees are going to get eaten up by this hurricane and your only hope is to anchor deep Take her out to deeper waters, put four anchors in four different directions, and leave enough slack in the rope that they can absorb the movement of the ocean, and then pray that everything turns out okay. Well, it turns out that was the best advice ever. The, the little old leaky boat survived the storm, whereas hundreds of other boats that had been moored to their piers along the shore were destroyed and thrown up onto the onto the to the, uh, to the land. And what Lucado said was is that a lot of what passes for Christian teaching today is so shallow. And the important thing is is we need to set our anchors deep. The problem is is if you, if you live in a shallow walk, you can take your rope and tie it to the nearest tree and it's going to feel very secure until the storm comes. When you start being battered by life and you start realizing that your rope is not your salvation, you're surely going to be destroyed by the storms of life. You'll be broken by the trials that come your way. But as the writer of Hebrews put it in chapter 6, he was talking about God's glorious promises and he said this, we have this hope, God's glory, as an anchor for our soul, firm, and secure. You see, our hope is placed in Jesus, who came from and returned to the glorious presence of his Father. That's deep doctrine, and that is thoroughly practical advice. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. I'd like to pray for us. This is one of those moments that ought to lead us to worship. And so we're going to worship today. We're going to worship through celebration and song. I'm excited about the Emmanuel Quartet sharing with us today. But can I just remind you that our, our future, our hope is pinned to the glory of a resurrected Savior, to God the Father who loved us so much that he would send his only Son, to the presence of the Holy Spirit in us who provides that, that unique comforting that the Holy Spirit gives, and all of it wrapped up in the glory of God. This is deep. And this is who we are meant to be. Lord, I thank you so much for the book of Romans, for this letter that Paul wrote to a, to a battered church that was facing an incredible storm uh, that needed to know the security of something uh, stronger than just some kind of pep talk uh, surface uh, solution to the problems of their life. They needed to know about God's glory. And they needed to be able to anchor deep into that. Help us, Lord, to do that today. 
Lord, help us not to live on the, in the shallow end of, of our faith. Help us to grow deeper and deeper in your word as we study and we commit ourselves to being in your word and to even taking the hard things that sometimes are beyond our initial comprehension and to let your Holy Spirit do the teaching for us that no human can. Thank you, Lord, for this day. We ask that you be worshipped and glorified in everything that takes place in this moment. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.